So the Gambia, uh, it was a beautiful place of peace, of music, of good food, of tradition and culture, weddings, beautiful weddings, beautiful colors. We used to nickname Gambia the Smiling Coast. And Gambia, no problem. Other countries used to make fun of us that no matter if you tell the Gambian, can I have the moon by tomorrow 12? They'll be like, oh, no problem. When you come back, if they can get it, they say, oh, I tried, but I just couldn't get the moon. So they always make fun of us. The Ga Gambians, everything is no problem. Anybody who knows Gambia before will tell you that, yes, it was small. It's still small, of course. Uh, but it was poor, it is still poor. Uh, but uh, we had one thing. We had freedom. We had uh, democracy. I cherish freedom. And we used to you know, go to bed without even shutting our doors. Nobody cared because at the time, nobody was coming there to do any harm to us. But all that tradition changed in 1994. From left to right. Around 6 p.m., the military made an announcement on one of the radio stations. You know, Lieutenant A.A. Jamme. That the government that was had been overthrown and it would be replaced by the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council. In fact, the first headline that came after the coup was an interview that the Daily Observer did with Chairman Jamme then. It was, we will never introduce dictatorship in the Gambia. As soon as they started introducing decrees, decree number one, we restricted political involvement. We knew there was a problem. Then came decree number four, political gatherings, political writings. Pol they were all banned in that country. Uh, that was August uh, of 1994. First time I went back was in 99, and it was unrecognizable, the place was. It was not the Gambia that I knew, as well as there were all these armed soldiers at traffic stops everywhere. It looked like a military state. Best way to describe Gambia is that it's a climate of fear. Um, dissent is criminalized. Um, there is really no space for disagreement with the president and his policies. My paper ran a story on the coup, and we discovered that a lot of people were arrested and in secret. And our fear was that these people were going to be executed. So I went home and they sent some intelligence officers in my neighborhood. And they came and knocked at my door exactly 12 midnight. I was on bed already. So they woke me up. And my wife said, my wife asked me to jump over the fence. I told her, no, I have not committed a crime. And even if I committed a crime, I will still hand myself over because I'm a citizen and I believe in the rule of law. Musa Sadi Khan was arrested and held without charges for 22 days. They decided to torture me. And that was why I had this mark here. And I had, you know, mark all over my body. The main reason of cutting here was they said I was becoming too stubborn. My mouth is a problem. And they also, you know, broke my right hand into four pieces. So I had to be in pain for three weeks. And when I was, when I was released from jail, the other troubling thing was that I still wanted to stay in the country and practice as a journalist. But how can I stay in the country when I was in pain and no doctor was bold enough to conduct examination on me, let alone issued me a medical certificate or treat me? And one of the doctors was so frank to me, he told me point blank that even as I am talking to you right now, I'm being monitored and I'm scared. It gave me some painkillers and asked me to leave the country. He said, you are a young man. You have a whole future ahead of you. Leave the country, but no doctor is going to treat you. Uh, Gambia falls in that uh, category of an autocratic state that controls the lives of everybody. Torture is very institutionalized, although at the same time, it's very much at the whim of the president. I mean, the president uh, evidently decides who is going to be tortured and, and who is not was at the height of the so-called Arab Spring, and we got very excited and thought it's our turn to do something here too. And uh, it was during that process that uh, I got uh, so excited on African Liberation Day.
We decided to print 100 t-shirts calling for an end to dictatorship. I not only distributed all of the t-shirts personally, but I wore them for several days. And that's how I got arrested and uh, eventually charged with treason and uh, given a life sentence. I spent uh, eight months in solitary uh, confinement. I was not able to stand it. I call the press and I make my summons on my pulpit, on my mosque, came with the necessary verses of the Holy Quran to back up my point, and I asked him not to execute them. My request was published on the papers, and it became viral. So I started having threats, calls, unanimous calls, that I have to leave the country, I should not go against the president, I should not appeal, who am I to appeal to him? I continue, that's what I believe in. I was put into jail, this is the way it came. They came at night, 11 of them, in dark clothes. You cannot recognize them. The only their eyes that you are seeing. And they normally come one o'clock at night, beating, hitting, torturing, and doing all what not, till five o'clock in the morning. Since the beginning of Jame's regime in 1994, thousands of people have been disappeared and killed without trial for their perceived acts of defiance against Jame's rule. Over 100 friends and relatives of those that participated in the December 30th, 2014 coup attempt were disappeared for over six months. The youngest was 14-year-old Yusafa Lo. 600,000 Gambians are food insecure. Right now, as we speak, there are Gambians who, if they have breakfast, they cannot afford lunch and dinner. Okay? It is a country that we used to eat and have leftovers for the, you know, the pigs that we rear, they, they rear the pigs in the, for, to go and have food. That's no longer the case because there's nothing to throw away anymore. If you have any food at all, you will be lucky. It, it cannot go on. So he came to power in 1994 through a coup uh, with, with no money to his name. He did not come from a, a family that had money. Now he's buying $4 million mansions uh, in the United States. Now he's, you know, buying luxury cars. Um, so where is he? Where is he getting this money from? You know, obviously that raises a lot of eyebrows, concerns about the rampant um, corruption, uh, lack of transparency in the country. He's also um, uh, really emerged as one of the most, um, you know, a recognized heavy-handed uh, dictator um, in terms of the lengths through which his government has gone to, to maintain control. If I, those who accuse me of human rights violations, <laughs> Well, I leave them to the Almighty Allah. So, how long you stay in power does not determine your fate. It's what you do that determines your fate, as far as I'm concerned. But let me tell you one thing. My fate is in the hands of the Almighty Allah. I will deliver to the government people. And if I have to rule this country for one billion years, I will, if Allah says so. There may be elections from time to time, but there's nothing democratic about the exercise of power. What do you mean by unity government? Unity government. Unity opposition. No, why is that? Why is that? I don't have an opposition. You don't have an opposition. But we have a big one here in this country. And I, will, I will, and I will not work with them. We've done everything that is possibly available to us democratically. I'm one who believes in a democratic process, and I've always advocated for that. But when you close all avenues of peaceful change, then you make violent change inevitable. That is what is happening in the Gambia. Because you can't do I just printed T-shirts in the trade and dictatorship now. 100 T-shirts distributed, I get a life sentence. Politicians, the political parties, their leaders get picked up, thrown in jail. And uh, journalists criticize the regime, you disappear. 
you, come, you go to the international community, do all the advocacy, they put out a press release, and then that is it. So what else did you left there? If you, you know, it's easy if you are just talking about some other country and folk, but if it's your mom, your father being picked up, disappeared, and not even being charged, of, you know, the government itself not respecting our laws, what do you expect? You know, at some point, you'll be like, okay, forget the U.S., forget, you know, I'll take any risk to try to change this because it's not sustainable. Knowing if you succeed, they're, they're the same ones who would come and say, oh, glad you did it. But if you fail, you know, they'll say, why did you do that stuff? And what you're fighting for is essentially to set up something similar to what you have here. And even here, you didn't go beg the British, say, hey, can you let us, you know, go? No, it's very frustrating, but it's something, something has to be done. And if we don't stand up, if we don't do anything, no one else is going to do it for us. They said no matter how long a stick stays in the river or a stone, it can never turn into a crocodile. I am here, but I, I am an American right now, but I have the heart of the Gambia. Every time something happens, you feel so hopeless and you just like, we might as well just give in. But then you can't, because then another story comes in of somebody who's been brutalized, and you, you, you I just can't take this. I can't sit down and watch this. Even if it seems like what I'm doing is not making any difference, what else can I do? The other alternative is to sit down and just not do anything. Nobody else is doing anything. So you, you just keep doing any little thing, even though it feels like you're this little ant against an ocean. So it's not an option to give in. And Freedom does have its price. It's never free, and it's paid for usually not by the majority, but a few. And so for that, it is worth it. It's worth it.